Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here today. We're back in the book of Luke today as Jesus teaches us how to live and, and how we should live in light of what he has done for us as the Lord Jesus Christ has come himself and displayed perfection and lived a perfect life and then died for our sins. Because of that, how should we then live as his people? And so it's a very practical lesson as we go through the book of Luke. If, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, um, you, will, you will find these things probably uh, difficult to hear and yet refreshing to hear because none of us is perfect. Amen? Mostly me. So let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you for your love towards us, which is undeserved and unearned. And Lord, when we were still without hope that you came and you gave your life for us, I thank you. I pray that you help us, Lord, as we look into your word, that you would speak to each one of our hearts and that we might live in your love and that you might help us to love one another. Lord, we struggle so much with the things that go on in our heads and our hearts, the things that we've picked up from the world, the things that we've gotten through our genetic code, our sinful nature, and of course, the things we've chosen. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would wash over us and teach us and renew us and help us to be more like you so we might trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we're in Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 34. Uh, some of the things that I didn't cover last week, I kind of cut it short for the sake of time. I really am trying to get you guys out of here in 45 minutes. So I hope you appreciate that because I could go on for hours. Some of you know that. Well, you're a very gracious group to stay silent. Okay. <laughs> Jesus says in Luke 12, 15, and he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. I think especially in America, that's a really good word to us because we can get caught up in the stuff that we have and covetousness uh, or want, just this constant hunger that's just not satisfied. We can walk around with it where we feel like our life is not good enough. The things that we own are not good enough. The people we spend time with are not uh, up to par, you know, and just nothing good enough. And that's what covetousness is. It's this ever-present sense. It's like when you're hungry and you haven't eaten and you know you're not going to eat for at least 45 minutes. <laughs> and there's that hunger that just always sits with you. That's what covetousness is. It's this always wanting and never being satisfied with what you have. And can you imagine what it is to eat and, and eat a bunch and still not be satisfied? That's what our spirit is like when we don't know God and when we don't have a relationship with them. We're given over to covetousness and we look for other things to fill the void of our life to define who we are that we attach our identity to, whether it's a new car or a new phone or a new house or a new wife or, you know, whatever it is, we attach our identity to it until the luster of it wears off and we realize it doesn't fill that place that only God can fill. And so that's what covetousness is kind of in a nutshell. So... As we move forward, we'll pick it up where we were last week. Um, I'm sorry, a couple weeks ago, we were looking at hypocrisy where Jesus speaks to the Pharisees and the scribes about their hypocrisy, where they claim to know the law and yet they didn't live it. And they felt the law was for everyone else but themselves. And that's hypocrisy, we're pretending to be something that you're not. And we looked last week into accountability. We looked into hypocrisy and the fear of God and what it is to trust him, that he's an intimate father, that he knows all of our needs, that even sparrows uh, that are bought for a couple coins, they, they don't fall to the ground without his knowledge. So we have this intimate knowledge. He has this intimate knowledge of us and every aspect of our lives. This week, we're going to talk about managing desire. How many of you have got that figured out? Oh, good. So you came to the right place. Managing desire, and there are two things Jesus speaks of. One is covetousness, and the other is worry. It was very quiet that day. 
because I think we struggle with these things. Picking it up from verse 13. Then one of the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? And he said to them, take heed or beware, be careful and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do? It's a nice problem since I have no room to store my crops. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have promised, provided? And so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink or have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after and your father knows that you have need of these things. But seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags, which do not grow old. And treasure, and I'm, I'm sorry, a treasure in the heavens, which does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And he said to his disciples, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which they have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, how much more will he clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. So Jesus speaks about covetousness, and about worry. It's very quiet in here. We've talked about this, somebody raising themselves up in the middle of a crowd and, and shouting out to Jesus, hey, you need to fix this thing I got with my brother. You know, tell him to share the inheritance with me. Which, imagine how his brother feels. He's probably right next to him. And he's shouting this out in the middle of a crowd. Apparently he has no uh, guard on his brother's dignity. And he certainly it's not a private matter. He's made it public, which is humiliating. And that doesn't usually receive a very good reception from the other party. And yet Jesus tells him to beware of money, of covetousness, because your life is not the sum total of the things that you have. It's not the guy with the biggest toys who wins, regardless of what you think. We talked about this last week about Ebenezer Scrooge and how he was so tight with the money and he had no pleasure in his life. And, you know, there, there are reasons that they give you throughout the thing as to how that happened. He once loved and he, he had lost that and turned his heart away and, because he chose money. He chose money over, over a relationship. And because of that, he was miserable. Money is cold and a terrible partner. Covetousness is desiring more of what you have enough of. I think that's a really good uh, definition for covetousness. It's this ever-present want that's never satisfied. Any of you know what I'm talking about? You know, I have a, I have a beautiful guitar, but, you know, it didn't cost me $6,000, so it's not good enough. You know, I have a really nice car, which was given to me as a gift, but it's got a dent in it. You know, really need a new one now. You know, it's our hearts, if we seek to find wholeness, in stuff, we're always empty. If we find wholeness in Christ, 
it's done, it's over. And it doesn't matter what you're driving, if the you know, if things half falling apart, it doesn't matter. You're grateful you can get from one place to another. And that's what we really need to do is kind of take a look at that so that enough is enough. He spoke this to them about the ground of a certain man who yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? That's a really nice problem, right? Wow, I've just been given all this money or all this finance or all this stuff and I don't have enough room to hold the blessings that God's given to me. It's a nice problem, right? How many of you would like to have that problem? Good, you're being honest. Not if your soul's required of you tonight. <laughs> who, know, who in the world's going to, you know, what are you going to do with that stuff? He says, I know what I'll do. I have no room. So I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns. In other words, the ones that he already has. They're apparently not good enough. And I'll build greater. And there I will stall all my crops and my goods. So you can picture this guy sitting down and figuring out, okay, how many square feet do I need? I'm gonna, it's like tearing down this church and building a giant you know, multi-floor complex. You know, we have too many people here in church, so what we'll do is we'll make a mega church. I would never get to say hello to all of you guys if we did that. So we find a pastor and we send you down the street and split the church. That's what I think. Then effective ministry can be done when you have smaller groups. But he says, no, what we're going to do is tear down what I have and build bigger barns so that they're going to store all my stuff. That sounds like a good thing. But the question is, what is a need and what is a want? Any of you married people ever have this conversation, argument, slash intense fellowship with your mate? Do we really need that? Do we need a helicopter? Really? Yeah, we drive in New Jersey. Of course we need a helicopter. It's the only place you can get through. Needs and wants. So is what you need more room or less stuff? In this man's case, he's got more stuff than he has room for. So what do you do? Well, of course, you, you go get a, a you store it place and you store it there. And you pay people to sit on it for years. That's what you do because you have so much stuff you don't know what to do with it, so you just store it, and then you procrastinate, and you put off the fact you gotta deal with that stuff, and after a while, you don't even know what's in there. Do any of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, all right, I'm just checking, because you're very quiet. You're making me wonder if I'm just, just me. Covetousness is desiring more of what you have enough of. I have enough. I have enough of what I need, I have my needs met. And to be content with that, that's a big deal. It says in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You guys know who mammon is? <laughs> of course you don't know who mammon is. That's not a person at all. It's deified confidence in wealth or avarice. It's that cocky attitude that people have when they're wealthy and they feel above you. Do you realize that that's idol worship? That's idol worship. That's what this is saying. You can't, you can't serve God, make him the top priority along with money and the avarice and the pride that comes with it. They're incompatible because if God's first, that means you're going to serve him with everything you have. It's not even yours. You're just taking care of it for a while. You guys know that, right? You don't own anything. You're just taking care of it for a little while and you'll hand it off to someone else who may have earned it or may not have earned it. And if they haven't earned it, they'll squander it. Isn't that sad? There are a lot of people that when they die, they leave tremendous sums of money to their offspring and then they blow it. Poof, gone. The things that have been worked for and saved and people have scrimped and suffered and sacrificed in their life and they give it to those who don't appreciate it and when you're gone and they dry the tears, they spend all the money instantaneously because they don't, they haven't earned it. So they don't appreciate it. Deified confidence in wealth or avarice. And I will say to my soul, 
Soul? Yeah, that's the way I talk to myself. Soul? You have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Retire. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be in which you have provided? So is he who, treasure, who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That's one of those passages that makes you want to go, ooh. Because it's a heavy thought, right? Just when you finally think that you've reached it and you're now going to be content because you know, you've know you saved a bundle of money and you're ready to retire and you punched your card and you're done and you could sit back and do nothing. I thought that's what retirement was. <laughs> you know, it's not unusual for people to die soon after retiring. You know, oh, well, I got, I got my house in Florida. I'm going to play golf every day. But it's too hot. Nobody goes and plays golf down in Florida. Especially when you get older. It's funny. The older you get, usually the more wealth you accumulate, but the less you can use it because physically you don't. Who's, who's going to play in 95 degree weather? out play golf. It's probably a couple of you, but unless you're young and healthy, it's not a good idea. But you see, all of his confidence is in the money. And I, I wish I had the rest of this picture. Do you see this here? You see the sword that's drawn right here? <laughs> Here's the guy counting up all of his crops and little does he know death lurks right behind him. If you're working for retirement because you think that's finally going to be the pie in the sky, you will be sadly mistaken. Because what happens is, if you don't think you're going to do anything, you're going to eat, drink, and be merry, and sit back and do nothing and have no purpose, then you know what? You have no purpose. You have no purpose. Why are you living? I think about the line from Scrooge. If they're going to die, they should get on with it already and decrease the surplus population. That's what he said. That's his view of people because money was so important to him. People weren't important at all. So that's what's going to happen if you don't treasure up treasure in heaven as opposed to just treasuring for yourself. You have to be rich in God, which is a very different thing. Here's the secret, guys, from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. We're, in, we're encouraged, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself, meaning Jesus, has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Be content with the things that you have. Contentment. You know, it's something that you need to exercise self-control. You need to control your desires so that you don't do everything you want. Amen? Yes. Okay. Uh, if we did everything we wanted, it would be mayhem. At, at least in my life. In Philippians 4, 11 to 13, in, in exhortation to the Philippians, he says, not that I speak in regard to need because they had sent a gift to him and he was thankful. For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, which means is to have nothing. And I know how to abound, which is to have plenty. Everywhere in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, we probably have verse 13 memorized. You might even have it tattooed somewhere. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can be content when I'm hungry. I can be content when I'm suffering. I can be content when I have a bunch of money and I don't have to spend it. I can save it or give it away. I'm content. I have enough. My wife asks me, honey, what do you want for Christmas? I'm like, I don't need anything. No, 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 really, really, what do you want? I don't, I have no needs. I, I can't, th I mean, with socks and underwear, I'll be content with that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a happy guy. You know, I have enough ties. I got, I got enough of everything. I have enough of everything. What in the world could I possibly want? 
a weight loss program. That might be a need that I have, but I'm not going to put that on my list. Anyway, I have a plan. I have a plan. But anyway, contentment. Contentment is not something that the world thinks is a good idea. And if you put it on your resume, your, your prospective boss will look at you funny. Say, well, contentment means you're going to be lazy, right? No, no, no. I don't have a lot of time, and so I'm going to use my time in a way that glorifies God, which is a very different economy than what people are looking for in an, in a, an employee. But if you tell them, well, what do you think your greatest characteristic is? And you say, contentment. I've learned how to suffer need and hunger and, and be good with that. And I've learned how to abound and have a bunch of things and, and, and not get proud about it. And I've learned how to have absolutely nothing and not complain about it. Next, they'll probably hire somebody else, you know, because contentment is not a valued quality today. But I would, I would much rather have employees that were content than employees that were discontent. Because then you turn your back and what happens? Me, 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 me. Or they take stuff, yeah, because they're discontent. So the world doesn't understand it, but that is the quality that is the secret to managing desire, to not worrying about things and not giving in to covetousness it's to be content. First Timothy 6, verses 6 to 10 says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. The Bible says it's, a, it's an awesome quality. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Food and clothing. Not the newest phone, not the newest car, not the biggest house. With food and clothing, the, the basic needs, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition or waste. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Amen. We will be content with, the, with these. Notice it's not the people who are rich fall into problems. It's those who desire to be rich fall. So it's not necessarily the having of the things. It's this covetousness. It's this constant want of it's never enough. Like uh, I believe it was J.P. Morgan who said, uh, someone asked him, said, when are you going to have enough money? And he said, just a little more. This guy was making a million dollars a day, and that's when a million dollars was more than it is today. Verse 22, and then he said to his disciples, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, about what you will eat, about your body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. How many magazines are actually fabricated about those things. How many millions of dollars do people spend checking out fashions? What's cool? What's not cool? What looks good? What doesn't look good? What colors are in? Where, you know, food. You got food channels. Everybody's cooking. I, that just makes me hungry. I, <laughs> I have no interest, no interest in making food, just eating it. And of course, when we worry, we develop what professionals like to call a phobia. You know, we, there's lots of phobias. You know, there, there's all kinds of phobias. You, you probably know some. Lucy from uh, the, the Peanuts character, she, she actually knows some. And she'll tell you about the phobias that you can come up with. You know, there's a, there's a fear of paper. There's a fear of the color red. There's a fear of color black. There's a fear of the color yellow all of the ones that I have up here on the stage. There's a fear of failure. It's called a telephobia. I remember that one, because I have, I have a little bit of that, a fear of failure. But there are all of these chromophobia, afraid of colors. You see, because if you can put a name on it and a label on it, then suddenly you're exonerated from having to face it because you're sick. It's like getting diabetes or anything else, so it's not your fault. You have a phobia. It's like getting a cold. You need professional help. 
It's not that you've lost control of your mind. It's not that you've allowed your fears to, to run away with you. No. What you need is deep medication and lots of therapy, which will take years, and confrontation. You know what they do to get you over the fear, right? They confront you with the thing you're afraid of. If you're afraid of dogs, guess what they're going to do? Eventually, after they make several thousand dollars, they're going to take you to where all the dogs are. They're going to put you in the middle of a dog park, shrink wrap you so you can't get out. That's how you take care of fear. You have to face fear. That's the only way you're going to get rid of it. If you're afraid of paper, maybe you should uh, have a job pushing some paper. But here are some of the craziest things that I've seen. I iconophobia, doxophobia, that's, a, that's having a fear of praise. See, Brian, I, I knew you were that way. <laughs> but there are all of these things that people get afraid of and they feel justified in it because, well, there's a term and there's a diagnosis and I'm seeing a professional and it's okay because it has a name and because if we label it, then, you know, it's okay and you've, you, you no longer have to take responsibility. But here Jesus says, do not worry. That's, that's pretty clear, right? We worry about persons, problems, pressures, places, responsibilities, family, friends, foes, future. Worrying about the future. Safety, security, tests and trials, health and wealth, fears, failures, and foes. These are all the sort of things that somebody, this is Mr. Fa Mr. Worry, by the way. He's got all of that going on. And you probably have a particular issue with something. I don't know if they have a name for it yet. Maybe you haven't talked to somebody and they haven't labeled you, but you probably have a fear of some kind. There are people who are afraid to let their children go outside. They're afraid themselves to go outside. There are people who are afraid of heights. There are people who are afraid of dark. There's people who are... Take your pick. Everybody's got something, right? So here's some fear of lightning. Ostrophobia. <laughs> they... they, they how many people are afraid of lightning? Okay, I've just diagnosed you. There you go. Yeah, no one likes to get struck by lightning. There's no one lining up and going up on the roof in a rainy day. I mean, anyway, these are normal phobias and fears. And Jesus said, do not be afraid of your, for your life. Don't be afraid. Don't give in to fear. Because you know what happens when, when fear takes hold of you? You're no longer in control. That thing that you're afraid of is in control. You know, if you're afraid of dogs and you see a dog, oh, oh no, he's looking at me. Well, he's on a leash. Yeah, I know, but he could break that leash. He could break away. I've seen it happen. All right. You are completely toast. I mean, you can't think about anything. You can't concentrate on anything. I'm surprised you'd be able to walk or breathe. There are people that are just that struck with fear. You can't let fear take you over. You can't. Because it won't be you anymore. You'll be a slave to that fear. Now, there are people who actually need medication. There are people who need uh, mental health because they have real issues. They go through some post-traumatic uh, stress disorder and, and they have PTSD. Or there are real issues that people are afraid of. And it's usually from traumatic events or from uh, uh, unstable uh, in, in their blood. But these things need to be taken care of and addressed. And... Sometimes if you don't address it when it's in the baby stage, suddenly it takes you over and then you have an issue. And I've, I've known many people that struggle with fears and it's because they let a little fear take over and they gave it permission to rule. And I, when I think about Paul and says, you know, all things are permissible for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are permissible for me, but I will not be ruled by any of them which means I don't want anything telling me what I should be doing in my life. The Lord should be telling me what to do. So, worry is thinking and emotionally taking responsibility for something you have no control over. Don't raise your hands. How many of you were worried about our government? It's hard not to raise your hand, isn't it? <laughs> Sit on it. How many of you are worried about the state of our economy? 
Last month, inflation went up 6.3%, more than it's been in 39 years. I, 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 I could make you afraid. All you have to do is watch the news for a while. All of these isms that are coming out and, and all of these people that are crying out to be the most important thing and their agenda to be the most important thing and the media skewing everything. Yeah, you can get all freaked out about that stuff. Can you do anything about that? You might. You can sign a petition. You can call your congressman. There's, you know, there are things that you can actually do. By the way, that's not worry. That's good, healthy concern. Worry is when you carry something mentally, you're thinking it over and thinking it over and thinking it over and you're worried about it and it's now part of your emotions and you're getting all riled up about it, but there's not a thing you can do about it. Do you see the insanity? How many of you participate in this insanity? <laughs> Worry is when you carry something mentally or emotionally that you can do nothing about. Refuse to carry it. Pray about it. Pray about it and give it to the one who can change things. If you can't do anything about it, you know God can. You know God can change a leader's heart. It's like that. Like he changes the course of mighty rivers. Ben Steele and his, no, I'm sorry. Verse 24, consider the ravens, Jesus says, for they neither sow nor reap. And they neither storehouse nor barn and God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? He says this word, consider the birds of the air, or consider the ravens. In uh, Matthew, he says, consider the birds of the air. The word is, here is used, katano'o, which means to fully know, that word consider. He says, you should fully know about ravens. You should really sit, contemplate, and meditate about birds. In other words, look to the birds and learn something. You know, you can learn something from birds. Jesus said so right here. Just consider, know fully what's going on with the birds. Because I don't know if you've ever met a dog that has separation anxiety. <laughs> where you can't leave the dog alone or they'll tear up your house. Fear is a really good thing when you're running from a bear. But it's a terrible thing when you have separation anxiety and your, your master needs to take you everywhere. But see, Jesus says, why are you worried? You know, when we worry, what we're doing is saying God isn't watching or somehow this is going to slip by him and he's really not in control. He's not sovereign. That's really what we believe when we get fearful. That God doesn't care about me. Maybe I believe for you, but I don't believe for me. You know, God will bless you and help you, but he won't help me. Because, you know, I'm a dirty dog and you don't know that, but he knows that. So isn't that what goes in our head? God doesn't care. And yet he does. We need to have this simple, dependent faith. I don't know about you, but if I was in a sack on somebody's back on a bicycle, I'm not sure how well I'd be doing. Hey, hey watch out for the rock. Hey, whoa. I'd, I'd want to see in front of me. I don't want to see what's behind me. I got to tell these people what to do because they don't know how to drive. I know you guys don't ever have that problem. Worry is believing that everything is up to you. It's believing that everything rests upon you. That's what worry is. Does everything rest upon you? Of course not. And you have to trust other people, don't you? <sighs> well, what if they let you down? You need to be like Paul, learn to be content in every situation. Whatever it is, it is. You adapt, deal with it. Verse 25, and which of you by worrying can add one cubit to your stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? You guys do know that by worrying, you can't get any taller. I did some investigation on this word, stature. And it doesn't mean that. Uh, let me share with you. First of all, we think that we can add to our lives by working out. Do you guys know that? I, I, I have a schedule every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I don't get there Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but it's on my schedule. <laughs> I was there on Friday and I'm very sorry for it right now. 
So it's difficult to move or lay down or speak. So <laughs> these are 20 benefits from exercising. And I can tell you, you, it is seen, they have done research. They find that the average person who exercises one hour will live one hour longer. For every hour that you put in exercising, you will add an hour to your life. But you just spent that hour at the gym. So you better like it. If you're going to go there and torture yourself and you don't like it, it's not worth being there, man. Just die early. <laughs> you're going to live an hour longer for every hour that you exercise. And you're going to spend it exercising. I think of these things on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Your expiration date is beyond your knowing or controlling. Your expiration date is beyond your knowing or controlling. You know, that's, they say the two things in life are inevitable is death and taxes. You cannot control that day. If the Lord wants to take me home today, I'm done. Find somebody else that's much smarter than me next time. If the Lord wants to take you home today, there's not a thing you can do about it. So get comfortable with that that God's in control and not you. You don't control your life. There's no way that you will know the end and there's no day you can control the day when you leave. It could be today. So why not live like today was your last and fill your life with things that will honor God? In Psalm 31, 13 to 15, David writing, he says, for I hear the slander of many fear is on every side. And while they take counsel together against me, they scheme to take away my life. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation. You may have felt that way. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. I love this. David does this all the time. He talks about how he's in deep trouble. There's all these things going on that stand against him. But, but God, God is involved and he sits on his thrones and, and on his throne and he is unwavered by what's happening down here. And yet we forget that. We forget that God is sovereign above all things. So we can either get on his team or we can just worry. Seems like a good choice. Live long and prosper. I, I don't know that you could ever say that to somebody in reality. Just because I do that and say live long and prosper doesn't mean you're going to live long and prosper, right? You guys are very quiet today. <laughs> By the way, adding a cubit to your stature, uh, that word stature doesn't mean height alone. It also means age. It means, the, it means the size of your life, if you will. Can you add 18 inches to your cubits, 18 inches? Can you add 18 inches to your life? Like if your timeline went from this time to this time, do you think you could take one more step if you worry about it? That's really what it means. Can you lengthen your life by worrying? Actually, it'll shorten your life. I just discovered yesterday that more than 90% of all heart attacks can be avoided if you remove stress. Oh, I thought it was my diet. I thought it was what I put in my face. It's stress. 90% of all heart attacks, uh, over the 90% of all heart attacks can be avoided if you remove stress. That's a crazy thing, isn't it? We live in New Jersey. What's wrong with us? And yet, if you learn like Paul to be content in every situation, then it doesn't matter where you live. So, these are some of the things that people are afraid of in 1998 and 2001. Snakes, public speaking, heights, <laughs> being closed in a small space, or claustrophobia, spiders and insects, arachnophobia, uh, needles and getting shots, mice, Flying in an airplane, dogs, thunder and lightning, crowds, 
going to the doctor and the dark. Notice from 98 to 2001 how they all grew, except for a couple. Guess about what people are afraid of now. Number one, in January of 2021, when this was taken, 79.6% of people were, were worried, concerned, in fear of corrupt government officials. Why do you suppose that is? Do you think it was the election? Number two, 58.5% were very afraid or afraid of someone they love dying. Then comes COVID-19. People I love becoming seriously ill was also part of that. Widespread civil unrest, a pandemic, major epidemic, economic financial collapse, and cyber terrorism. Notice snakes are right out. <laughs> no one's afraid of public speaking heights. Nobody's afraid of these things anymore. We now have a whole new set of fears and we feel justified because if you put the stinking TV on, that's all you're going to hear. We are so incredibly influenced by these things. Jesus said, do not worry about your life. So I refuse to be. By the way, how do we stack up with the rest of the world? Malaysia, Sweden, South Africa, Japan, Russia, South Korea, Mexico, Colombia, Italy, and the U.S. Now we're more concerned with crime and violence. <laughs> Everyone else is worried about the coronavirus or uh, corrupt government. And that was just taken recently. Oh, gee, I wonder why that is. It's amazing how people's fears follow whatever the media is telling them to be afraid of. So refuse it. Verse 27, Jesus says, consider, by the way, you know what that means? It means to know fully. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. In other words, they, they don't fabricate clothing. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? See, Jesus is using reason here. Think about this. If God makes these beautiful flowers to decorate, and by the way, I think flowers are beautiful. I don't think you should cut them down and give them to anybody. I think you should just leave them alone. They serve a purpose, right? There's the procreation of of. of of flowers. You're only going to have flowers if they pollinate and the stamens and the bees and the whole deal. Anyway, I think they're absolutely awesome. This is God's artwork and he decorates the, get the grass. So any of you who say, I don't believe in fashion. I don't think I should ever look good for any reason. Well, God decorates the grass, which would be pretty just one color, which is brown right now in my lawn. But he takes these beautiful flowers, these lilies, and he decorates the grass. And what are they there for? They're basically there to reproduce and then they die again. And then they reproduce and they die again. So what's their purpose? You can eat some of them. Some of them will kill you. He says, you should know fully what's going on here. When you look at this, this is God's creative artwork decorating the grass. And the grass is, what's the grass worth? I mean, you might have had to pay for your lawn, but so why do we worry? Why do we worry? You know, by the way, I, I'm, I'm sure I'll get some mail about this. You know a mask won't stop a virus. But it makes us all feel better, doesn't it? Well, double mask will not stop a virus. What will stop a virus is if you stop breathing. I heard a doctor say that yesterday. They asked him, say, what would you advise people? And it was, it was on one of these big stations. And he says, the virus is insidious and you can't hide from it. <laughs> the guy gave him an invitation to berate everyone for not wearing masks or not getting a shot or not getting their booster. And they invited him to say that to all the people and he wouldn't say it. What he said was, the virus is insidious and there's no way you can hide from it. That's somebody who's dealt with his fear. 
Then he's being honest too, and he's a doctor, so that makes sense. Why do we, why do we fear? Worry discloses in us a shallow faith. Worry in us discloses a shallow faith. And Jesus said, how much more does he care about you? Oh, you of little faith. That's really the problem with worry is we don't trust God. We don't trust him. We think it's all on us. And do you seek and do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink or have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Worry makes us like the unredeemed world. Can you imagine witnessing somebody about Jesus and being full of fear, and them seeing all the fears that you have? And you're going to tell them that you have faith in Jesus Christ, and yet you're full of fear? Do you think there's a mixed message there? So you're saying you should put, I should put all my trust in the God of heaven. And you say he's sovereign above all things. And why are you all twisted up with fear? That's a really good question. It makes us like the unredeemed world. If you remember Solomon, the smartest man that ever lived besides Christ, the vanity of vanities, he says, all is vanity. In other words, everything is empty and meaningless. He made some bad choices. That's what, how he got that way. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? All go to the same place, all come from dust, and there they return to dust. You know, all the stuff that we get so invested in and so emotionally involved in, and uh, it's all going to go away and it's going to get forgotten. So why are you expending so much energy worrying about it? Like this guy. This, this is an old picture of somebody who was an engineer in Paris who was running late. And so they put the speed up and they wanted to get there on time. I, I have a fear of being late. I don't know if you, you have that. I don't know what the name of it is, but it's a fear of being late. Someone's looking it up on their phone right now, I'm sure. <laughs> I hate being late. I hate it. I despise it. I've been late and I hate it. This guy was all twisted up about being late. It didn't work out well for him, did it? Worry will kill you prematurely. Stress will take you out. And it's a lack of faith in a loving God. Matthew 6.34, Jesus adds this in in Matthew, uh, his gospel. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Which is another thing. There's probably a name for that. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You got enough to be concerned about and put effort towards today. Because tomorrow, you can't do anything about it. Don't worry about it. And of course, worry is taking on something where you think about and you're feeling something and you're thinking about it and you cannot change it. You know, like if you have to go and face your boss tomorrow and there's nothing that you can do, why are you worrying about it? I'll just take some time off until tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. Let tomorrow take care of tomorrow. You make sure you're concerned about today. Do not fear, Jesus says, little flock. I like that. It's only found here in, gosp- in, in this gospel. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Did you know it was God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom? I feel a sense of unworthiness. Sell what you have and give alms. In other words, give away your stuff. Provide things, provide yourself money bags which do not grow old. A treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In Psalm 100 verse 3 says this, Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Do you know that you're one of God's sheep? Makes me, makes me feel kind of funny. Who's responsible for you? God is. Do you put yourself in his hands 
Or do you say, no, no, I got, I got this, God. I got this. I can handle this. And you just make a mess of it. Luke 16, 9 says, And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. We talked about mammon. That when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Makes you go, what? It says you should use money to make friends. What? Buy your friends? I remember we put up a pool in our backyard. I had more friends than I knew what to do with. <laughs> it says that we should be using our money right now for influencing the kingdom in other people's lives so that you might share eternity with them. And wouldn't that be an investment? Imagine if you could take some money out of your pocket and share the gospel with somebody and provide for their physical needs as well and them accept Jesus Christ and then you share eternity with them and the thing that caused their ear to open was that you helped them with some physical need. That's what he's talking about. He says, sell what you have and give alms. Provide for yourself money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens. We should be about investing in the kingdom of God with what we have. You see, you see this lovely place that you're in? See the nice sound panels on the wall and nice new floor, comfortable new chairs? Just nod. I'll move on, I will. We spend a lot of money on this stuff. All these cameras, people watching us, and sound systems. And investing in the kingdom of God into the lives of other people is the best thing you could do with your finances, bar none, because it's going to be an investment for eternity. It's not going to last until you retire and then die and then give it to somebody else who will squander it. It'll be invested in the kingdom. So seek to bless other people with the things God gives you. In fact, the guy who stacked all that stuff in his barn, it's probably what he should have done. So, that's the end. I believe I'm just over 45 minutes. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and we have one more song for you. As Christmas is coming, yes, Christmas is coming. It is the birthday party of Jesus Christ himself. By the way, in case you thought it was just some kind of a mercantile exchange of finances for gifts, it is the most awesome birthday party for the most awesome person that was ever born. Just saying. You will be tempted to be covetous and to worry. Don't do it.